Education that does not produce a change in your heart, movement in your feet or money in your pocket is wasted information. Question is, am I going to get scammed? What is scam? Schemy, crafter, aggressive, malicious. People want to steal credibility and money. When we understand what the biggest scams of all are, we don't have to be trusting in them. What is fractional reserve spending? The gap between the very richest and the rest of us is getting bigger. Why? A common belief is that it's good for us all if a small group of people earn an enormous amount of money. The theory is that their wealth trickles down to the rest of us. But this is a myth. In reality, money is sucked up from all of us into the pockets of a very small group of people. How does this happen? One reason is the way that money is created. Right now, Almost all of the money in our economy is created by banks when they make loans. Now most people assume that when banks make loans, they're lending out someone else's savings. But they're not. Instead, when somebody takes out a loan, banks create new money electronically by typing numbers into their account. 97% of all the money in our economy is created in this way, as people take out loans from banks. The more loans people take, the more debt there is, and the more money there is. The shocking fact is, if nobody went into debt, there would be almost no money in the economy. Our economy depends on the electronic money created by banks. But because the money is created when people borrow, someone, somewhere, has to pay interest on every pound created. In effect, we are renting the money we need to run our economy from the banks. This means that in the UK alone, together we pay the banks £192 million in interest every single day. And because the debt is held mostly by the bottom 90% and wealth mostly by the top 10%, paying this interest transfers money from the bottom 90% of the population to the very top 10%. It sucks wealth and income from the rest of us up to the very lucky few. So as long as we have to rent the money we use from the banks that create it, we'll have to keep paying this huge interest bill, and the gap between the richest and the rest of us will keep increasing. Well, I think if the people knew what the banking system is up to, uh, as Henry Ford said, there would be a revolution tomorrow morning. Uh, the fact is most people think that what a bank does is lend you money that someone else has put in the bank previously. Um, but what a bank actually does, what a commercial bank does, uh, is to create money from nothing and then lend it to your interest. If I do that, if I manufacture money in my own home, it's called counterfeiting. Uh, if an accountant creates money out of nothing in the company accounts, it's called cooking the books. But if a bank does it, it's perfectly legal. Uh, and so long as you allow fraud to be legalized, uh, then all kinds of problems are going to pop up in the economic system, which you can't do anything about. Private banks create money out of nothing and lend it at interest. Now, that sounds absurd. Uh, when I teach sophomores, you know, about money and banking and how banks, they never believe it. And so you have to go through it again and again. Yes, banks really do create money. They really do. Here's how it happens. And it's absurd, and they're right to, to uh, doubt that that could possibly be what's really going on. But it is. Now, if the banking lobby is very strong, they're going to say, well, we don't want to change the system. We're making so much money out of it. What we have to do is, A, try and convince the people that it's their fault, um, that their wage claims are too high, and that's why we're having lots of inflation, or people are speculating on housing. That's why house prices are going up. What they're not going to say is that this is happening because banks are creating money out of nothing and pumping it into the system, and that's why prices are going up. But how is it that we've ended up with a system in which banks have the power to create money? Since 1971, when President Nixon took the United States off what was left of the gold standard, the world has operated under a system of money known as fiat. 
The dollar, the pound, the euro are all government fiat currencies. Fiat is a Latin word meaning let it be so. It is the law that this government currency be money. Indeed, without that legal enforcement and the fact that we must pay taxes with this money, that dollar bill or that computer digit that represents a dollar would be pretty much meaningless. Only the government has the power to issue fiat money, but banks can create it through lending. Over the last 40 years since this system of fiat money became the global norm, the supply of money has grown exponentially. In fact, we've seen the greatest growth in the supply of money in history. But who benefits? Of course, those that have the power to issue money, governments and banks. Then, those companies and individuals that get this money early. They can spend it before the prices of the things they want to buy have risen to reflect the new money in circulation. In other words, they get services, products or assets cheap. But prices soon rise, so holders of assets such as houses or shares will then see gains without there necessarily being any improvements to the company or house in question. Often this can lead to speculative bubbles. But what about those at the bottom of the pyramid? Those on fixed wages or incomes? Those who live in remote areas? Or those with savings? By the time this newly created money has filtered down to them, the prices of the things they want to buy have increased. Their savings buy them less, however, and their wages remain largely unchanged. In some cases, they have to take on debt just to be able to afford the things they were previously able to buy, which means they have to go back to the banks. In reality, this process of creating money only redistributes wealth from the bottom to the top of the pyramid. And thus, that ever-increasing gulf between rich and poor gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Well, when, when you get off the gold standard and you go into a fiat money currency, combined with a fractional reserve banking system, you end up compounding debt faster than you can ever possibly produce to support that debt. So eventually, you're going to find yourself back into debt slavery. And that's what's happened in the U.S. For every dollar of GDP, for example, in the U.S., it now it also creates something like five dollars and fifty cents worth of debt, because it's, this is this is what this is what happens when our economy flips over and basically capsizes. And of course, the government solution now to uh, to, to address all the problems is basically to create more debt. You can never get enough of a currency that doesn't work. You can print it till kingdom comes, but you can't print wealth, and you can't get yourself out of debt by making more debt. If you could print wealth, Zimbabwe would be the largest, most prosperous country on the planet. We all know it doesn't work. Of the money in the world today, 97% of it is debt. The French philosopher Voltaire once said, all paper money eventually returns to its intrinsic value, zero. Just to recap, fractional reserve banking. 90% of the money is created in loans. Here is a 100 trillion Zimbabwe note that is needed to buy basic things. That people would prefer US dollars because it can purchase more. But if your income and wealth are based on the strength of a currency, how will you protect yourself? Fiat currency is not backed by anything except our faith in the government printing it. And whenever the central bank prints more money, its current value will further lose its value. More and more people are needing money for food, clothing and shelter and money changers are taking advantages of this. with person-to-person -person international money transfers from one currency to another. It's all eaten up in fees. It can be expensive, but cryptocurrency is 80% cheaper, faster. So what exactly is cryptocurrency? It's a digital currency in which encryption techniques are used to regulate the generation of units of currency and verify the transfer of funds operating independently of a central bank 
You know, we don't have to understand how a digital camera or a digital TV works to enjoy the benefits of it. Nevertheless, here's a short YouTube. Digital currency is a digital coin that you can send through the internet. This currency represents value that is not issued by a central bank or government, but is accepted by people as a means of payment for goods and services. Digital currencies have a number of advantages compared to other alternatives. Traditional banks charge fees to process monetary transactions. This increases the cost of everything you buy. They can even freeze your account and refuse to release your money if they choose to. But digital coins can be transferred or exchanged over the internet from person to person, person to business, business to business, without going through a bank. This means lower fees, no account freezes, no arbitrary limits, and no restrictions on your account. Your digital coins can be stored in a digital wallet, cloud wallet, or cold storage, and can be traded on a digital currency exchange for other currencies, including the US dollar, the euro, and many others. What is mining? Digital currencies are generated all over the internet by anybody running an application called a digital currency miner. Mining requires a certain amount of work for each reward block of coins. This work is done by solving complex mathematical problems while simultaneously verifying transactions on the digital currency network. All this work is done by software running on specialized computer mining hardware. When two people exchange a digital coin over the internet, other people record and verify that transaction. When your mining hardware has computed and recorded transactions and you are lucky enough to complete a block, you are rewarded for this work with new digital coins from the network. Why should you mine? Well, one reason is because digital currencies are still in their infancy. In fact, Bitcoin, the first digital currency, was just issued in 2009. Since that time, the value of Bitcoin has risen dramatically. As the difficulty of mining new Bitcoins increases, the value of the coins have also increased. Thousands of merchants, including Dell, Overstock.com, Tiger Direct, Newegg, and many more now accept Bitcoin as a direct method of payment for their goods and services. As more places accept digital currency, the value of that currency tends to increase. More and more people are mining digital currencies every day. What is the history of Bitcoin? This is the value of it as of the 1st of the 4th, 2018. It's just climbed tremendously in the last 12 months. It's, it's was worth now 19,000 Australian dollars. It had peaked and it's gone down a little, but it's in cycles. Bitcoin was born out of the collapse of the Lehman Brothers in September the 15th, 2008. A person or group of people under the pseudoism Sudatsi Nakamoto published the first decentralized major cryptocurrency of worldwide value called Bitcoin. It's only supply and demand that determines the price of the currency, which is increasing as people recognize its usability. Digital currency can have a positive impact on the global economic climate according to Bill Gates. At first people were, and there's still some people saying, you know, it's a Ponzi scheme or a scam, the government will shut it down. But the governments and authorities now accept cryptocurrency and see it as a future of money and legitimate. They ruled CFTC ruling defined Bitcoin and digital currencies as commodities on September the 17th, 2015 which has added to the increase in value as it's more and more accepted. The RT tweeted on Friday, on June 2017, that despite the boom and the bust cycles, Bitcoin could continue to defy naysayers and continue growing first to 3,000, then 10,000 and all the way to 100,000 and beyond. Every time people are saying it's a bubble, it's going to burst, it's a fad, it's a scam, it's going back to a hundred dollars. And when it gets up to, they keep saying the same thing. It's going back to a thousand, now it's going back to three thousand as it keeps growing. But to say it's too late to get involved with Bitcoin, 
is like saying it's too late to get on the internet. Even if it is volatile, people make money on that volatility. And that's what causes the boom and bust. People are selling when it gets high. Here's another article from the CNBC in Special Report is saying Bitcoin could hit 100,000 in 10 years, says the analysis to correctly call its 2,000 price. Could make up to 10% of the 5 trillion average daily volume in the foreign exchange market in 10 years, according to Saxo Bank, Bank Analysis. So we can send it direct into people's Bitcoin wallet. Here are some companies that have invested in Bitcoin. PayPal. Bitcoin could hit a million in five to ten years, says the PayPal director, MoneyGram, Western Union, American Express, Microsoft, Google, MasterCard, Visa. You can see why all of these other cryptocurrencies companies are comparing themselves to Bitcoin. However, they do not have the usability that Bitloin currently does. Some of them may in the future, but everyone is, not everyone, but more and more people have heard of Bitcoin now.